any rate, so yeah, so I'm going to give my what I call my nano history. And I'm going to make some comments, a lot of comments actually, about the contributions of Gregoria Weber to this. And uh, oh, it's not, uh, why isn't it advancing when I hit my advance? Oh, OK, now it is. And there might be a few generally harmless remarks about Enrico along the way. OK, so any rate, so the discovery and characterization of fluorescence. I gave a talk many years ago at a workshop in the Netherlands. And I said, when do you think fluorescence was discovered? And the students talked and said, oh, they think around the 1940s by this guy Forster. And I realized, well, it's not such a bad answer if they've never learned about the field. So I thought, well, older people like me should try to educate people about the history. So, but first I have to give you change your views on some things. So when was the first report on fluorescence? And I wanna say that contrary to popular belief, it was not from the early ancestors of David and Enrico, okay? Because people sometimes think this, okay? Um, but this is not the case, okay? Despite what people may think about that. Nor was it from Enrico's kitchen, another misconception for some reason. and. I don't know why that is, but at any rate, forget that. Let's talk about the real history of fluorescence. And it's generally credited to Nicholas Monardes, a Spanish physician botanist who talked about the medicines of the new world. He didn't go there, but he read the reports of the conquistadors and others. And he's usually credited as the first to describe the bluish opalescence of water infusion from the wood of a small tree. And when made into cups and filled with water, a particular blue tinge was observed. Actually, I learned from Ulysses Acuna that it was uh, a Franciscan, Franciscan missionary, Bernardino de Sagun, who actually went there to the New World. And he actually described this independent. And he said that the Aztecs called this Coatli. So I think uh, he should get the really the credit for these early observations, but his work wasn't as well known as uh, Monardus's. Now an early translation by the influential Flemish botanist, uh, Charles de la Cluse, um, soon after that gave the name of uh, lignum nephriticum to the wood, which means kidney wood. And this helped to extend the, popularize the awareness of these optical uh, uh, properties in Europe. And the wood became very popular in Europe in the 16 and 1700s because of its medicinal values for treating kidney ailments. And, you know, it occurs to me that's particularly relevant to this workshop. We had several talks about kidneys and kidney ailments. So really this early work fits right in, you know. And an Englishman, John Frampton, translated Monardi's description as, and I quote, white wood which gives a blue color when placed in water that was good for them that doth not piss liberally and for the rains of the pains of the rains of the stone. So you can see a nice description of early fluorescence right there and, and kidney problems. But the first person who really did the uh, nice work on this was Robert Boyle, the famous Boyle of gas laws, et cetera. And, um, he was inspired by that work and he discovered that after many, inf so he wrote about this and he said after many infusions, the wood lost its power to give color to the water and he concluded there was an essential salt in the wood responsible for the effect, which is an amazing thought right there. I think that he's something's being extracted from the wood. He also discovered an addition of acid, abolished the color, stopped an addition of alkali, brought it back. And he actually wrote this. And um, so I like, Katie Reinhardt uh, sent me an original copy of the 1670 manuscript and you can read it. And he says, I found that according to my experiments, the colorless color immediately vanished when he added vinegar acid. And then he says a few drops of oil of tartar del deliquium brought it back and it took me a long time to discover that was potassium carbonate, what they called it back then in the 1600s. 
So Boyle was the first to use fluorescence as a pH indicator, and he really did. I've looked at other works of his now. I have several papers. And he would use the lignum nephriticum uh, color went to determine if some of his solutions were, we would say nowadays, were more acid or alkali. So uh, that's pretty amazing. You would love what we do nowadays. But the identification and fluorescein molecule from lignum nephriticum wasn't discovered till 2009 by Ulysses Zacuna and his colleagues. And I actually have a picture of Ulysses Zacuna at the end of my talk, and you'll see why it fits in there. And uh, this is from his paper. And he showed that there was a, he worked out the amazing chemistry of the change when you have an alkaline rearrangement of the starting material to the fluorescent material there. And that material, which they call um, natalaline, really we had a quantum yield of one and a lifetime 2.76. It was amazing to actually see the ancestral molecule. And in fact, when you put it in, and by the way, there will be a demonstration of this and some other stuff at the end. We couldn't arrange it right now, but at the end of the talk, Leonel is gonna show some of this in the lab. But I remember in my lab, I got some of the wood from Ulysses Acuna, and I had an alkaline solution in a hand lamp, and I dropped it in, and it lit up immediately. You can see the piece of wood there at the bottom. It's just amazing when you actually see it. And I found out more recently, or in 2018, now there's other works, people looking at other things, like one, one type of uh, sycamore tree gives a wood which also gives fluorescence depending on the pH. So it's sort of a coumarin type compound there, but it's funny, I mean, after people became more aware of the fluorescence properties, I think after Ulysses uh, paper and, and some stuff I did, but you begin to see the people looking at other woods. So you don't necessarily have to get your, holds, your hands on the lignum nephriticum, you can get these other woods to do this. But to take a little break from fluorescence per se, I think it's important to see what Galileo did. And uh, he described an emission from the famous Bologna stone discovered in 1603 by a Bologna shoemaker. And uh, it was known that when you, uh, this guy discovered when you put this in the sunlight during the day, then brought it in and heated it up at night, it gave off light. And I remember at the University of Illinois going across campus one day with Enrico to get the original Galileo manuscript, which Enrico translated and said, and I love this, it must be explained how it happens that the light is conceived into the stone and is given back after some time as in childbirth. But that already is an indication of thinking, well, there's some process, we you know now it's a phosphorescence lifetime. And Galileo was so stupendous, he was already thinking about this. Now, who else was important in fluorescence? Well, David Brewster in 1833 already described you have an alcohol, alcohol solution of leaves and you pass white light through it, you can see a red beam from the side. And of course, that's chlorophyll fluorescence. And chlorophyll, chlorophyll fluorescence nowadays is very important in plant health and photosynthesis. And they have portable fluorescence things to go into the field to look at the chlorophyll fluorescence. But in fact, it's even out of this world now because now they have satellites observing chlorophyll fluorescence from the satellite shining lasers down. And here's some maps. And I like this top one where you can see the, the chlorophyll in the, the red, the concentration in the Amazon, Central Africa, in the jungles of uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and uh, um, any rate, it's interesting that you can, people are looking at the health of some of these with satellites now using monitoring the chlorophyll fluorescence. Well, a very, very, very important person for our field was John Herschel. And uh, he was an amazing person, and I can't go into the details, but I read more and more about him a mathematician, astronomer, chemist, experimental photographer, and inventor. And here's a picture he took of himself in 1867. So it was pretty amazing. And he actually named seven moons of Saturn 
and four of the moons of Uranus, which was discovered, by the way, by his father, Sir William Herschel. In addition, he also translated the Iliad of Homer into English, and he invented blueprints while he was at it. So this guy was amazing. But for us, what was extremely important, in 1845, he made the first observation of fluorescence from quinine sulfate, which he termed epipolic dispersion. And this is his paper on the case of superficial color presented by a homogeneous liquid internally colorless. And it, and he described, and I love the way they wrote back then, he said it gave an extremely vivid and beautiful celestial blue color. And there it is, uh, tonic water, and you put a hand lamp up and you can see the fluorescence. In fact, having said this, of course, you might think of gin and tonic, and Enrico told, tells me that many bars have UV illumination that permit one to observe the fluorescence from a gin and tonic. Now, Naturally, I have no personal knowledge of this fact, but I believe in Rico, who I'm sure is much more knowledgeable of gin and tonics. But I wanted to mention for a minute, we can all realize the debt we owe to quinine. The more and more I realize as I did these lectures, it's probably the most important molecule in the development of the fluorescence field. Why is that? Well, let's talk about it first. Quinine is a bitter compound, comes from the bark of the chinchona tree. And this tree is most commonly found in South America, Central America, Caribbean, and parts of Africa. But by 1650, already shipments of chinchona bark were sent regularly from the New World back to Spain from its colonies for the treatment of malaria. They already discovered that it can be useful for treating malaria. In fact, in the 1600s, it was used around the Vatican too for that. And for more than 300 years, these trees were the only source of quinine, okay? And as we'll see, efforts to synthesize quinine eventually led to the development of the dye industry and synthesis of fluorescent molecules. But before we go into that, let's see some of the first work done on quinine by George Gabriel Stokes. And this guy absolutely has to be called the ultimate father of fluorescence, and I'll explain why. He had this wonderful paper in 1852, and of course I have a PDF, and anybody out there that wants a copy, send me an email and I will send you the PDF of Stokes' paper. It's 100 pages, and it's wonderful to read. And he also described this, he was interested from Hirsch, Herschel's work as a beautiful celestial blue color. But the very important thing for us now, in this work, he initially used the term dispersive reflection to describe this phenomena as other people had referred to it by quinine sulfate. But then he wrote a footnote, which is vital for all of us here. Okay, and the footnote said, and this is a, a clip from it, I confess I do not like this term. I'm almost inclined to coin a word and call the appearance fluorescence from fluorspar as the analogous term opalescence is derived from the name of a mineral. So if not for him, you would be having an advanced workshop in dispersive reflection applied to spectroscopy microscopy. So we have to, not only did he give the name to it, but he was the first one who really realized it's not just refraction or reflection of light like Newton thought it was, it's absorption and emission of light. That was Stokes that came up with that concept. And this was a beautiful experiment he did. He used a prism to disperse the solar spectrum to illuminate a solution of quinine. And he noticed that you saw no effect until the quinine went into the ultraviolet region of the spectrum. And he wrote this beautiful phrase, it was certainly a curious sight to see the tube instantaneously lighted up when plunged into the invisible rays. It was literally darkness visible. Altogether, the phenomena had something of an unearthly appearance. So they knew how to write back then. But these observations led Stokes to proclaim that fluorescence is of longer wavelength than the exciting light, which led to this displacement being called the Stokes shift. The next important person in this area, I would say, was William Henry Perkin, who you can see he's famous in England. He gets a plaque where he worked. And we're shown the structure of this compound mauve that he developed. But how did he come across mold, this purple pigment? Well, in fact, 
Oh, sh sh darn it. Every time I click on the wrong place, it goes to, uh, to that. Okay, you have to click outside. Well, in 1856, at the age of 18, he set off with the idea of, he was working for a chemist, the idea of making quinine. Again, why quinine? Because the British Empire was already everywhere and they were suffering from malaria. And so there was an interest to get quinine. So you didn't have to get the darn bark from the new world. And he oxidized aleotoluidine from coal tar and said he came up with, with mauve. And fortunately for him, what really kicked it off, Queen Victoria loved this color. So he started a company to produce dyes and next produced a green and a violet. And they say that the canal outside his factory turned a different color every week. And although some others had synthesized synthetic dyes around the same time, Birkin was by far the first to recognize the commercial for the potential for commercialization. It really started the synthetic dye industry. And histologists were already using this within a decade. And this is also interesting. He also, like Herschel, was an amateur photographer and he took a picture of himself at age 14. I don't even have a picture of myself at age 14, but Birkin has his. So who's the next important person along the line? Well, I would say that's Adolf von Bayer, who ultimately gave rise to the Bayer company, a German chemist. And he synthesized this compound. And I guess I don't have to tell you what that was. Okay, maybe I do have to tell you. Fluorescein, all right? And he synthesized that in 1871. And why did he call it fluorescein? I often wondered that, and after a day of library work I discovered from his early papers, he apparently coined the term, the name fluorescein from flow or fluorescence from Stokes' stuff and racine with his German for resorcinol because he reacted resorcinol with phthalic anhydride to give rise to fluorescein. And so the name actually tells you the synthetic route he took. And in 1905, he got the Nobel Prize in chemistry for all his work. So he was the first fluorescence person, let's say, that was recognized for this stuff. So, um, but already in 1877, already six years after von Bayer made this, they used fluorescein in a major groundwater tracing experiment in Southern Germany, this paper by Knopp and Oliver Holub, who used to work with Enrico, translated this for me. And it's, they took 10 kilograms of fluorescein and added it to the Danube on Tuesday, October 9th, 1877 at four o'clock in the evening. I love the detail, but it's important because the, if now we quote, the effect of the same in the spring of the Ock I show the stream of the Ock to the right, was detected on Friday, the 12th of October at daybreak, thus about 60 hours after the completed conduction of the experiment. And they said the water in the Ock in the spring was splendiferously green loosened for 36 hours. So the result of this experiment showed that the Danube and the Rhine rivers were connected by underground streams. And they still use fluorescent molecules for some of these water tracing uh, experiments. Now, you may think, oh, that's terrible, putting 10 kilograms of fluorescein in the river. What about the environmental protection agencies? Well, fluorescein is one of the few things that's so water soluble, it'll go right through your body, that St. Patrick's Day, the Chicago River is dyed green with 40 pounds of fluorescein. Well, now they use the last couple of years a new dye, but proprietary, but that's basically it. Okay, and I want to give now to show you what I call the opposite of a single molecule experiment. Oh. Do you see the fluorescein being thrown over the back of the boat? Yeah, it's clear that it's a very small mass. I thought it was the zone, but it's not. So there's fluorescein. But it's interesting to note that in 1897, 
uh, and rhodamine was made by Maurice Sarasol in a patent. Now, he worked for BASF, the big, a big German company, and he worked with Heinrich Caro, who trained with von Bayer. And so Heinrich Caro thought, well, we need to make more of these dyes. And he gave this job to um, Sarasol, and he made a series of red dyes, the rhodamines, and he called them rhodamine from the Greek rhodon, meaning rose. And they were amines, they were basic, and he synthesized a series of them, like rhodamine B, um, rhodamine 6G, rhodamine 3G, and others. And it's interesting, there's a whole series of papers in this journal, Biotechnic and Histochemistry by Cooksey, where he gives quirks of nomenclatures for many of these probes. So this came from Cooksey's things, but it's a wonderful series of articles on nomenclature. Already, Paul Ehrlich used urine in a sodium salt of fluorescein to track secretions in the aqueous humor in the eye, first in vivo use. And many of you have been to the, the ophthalmologist where they put a drop of a yellow thing in your eye, that's fluorescein, and then they shine a, a blue light and they can look at the green, which looks for uh, the, um, it can see things in the cornea and, and, and everything, if everything looks healthy. Um, and Nowak already in 1887 already published a book listing 660 compounds according to the color of their fluorescence. That of course was the earliest example of the molecular probe catalog I mentioned already. Uh, Mayer described the term fluorophore to indicate chemical groups making something fluorescent like chromophore from a bit did. And Heimstead and Lehman independently developed the first fluorescence microscopes as an outgrowth of the UV microscope. Okay, so this goes back quite a ways. Uh, one of the heroes in this early work about, was Stanislav von Provisek, who in 1914 published this paper on the fluorescence of cells, where he used a fluorescent microscope to study dye binding in the living cells. And he was doing this to study typhus, because typhoid epidemics were there. And he died of typhus that next year, actually. And I already mentioned Albert Kuhn's making fluorescein isocyanate and, and, uh, and uh, Riggs making FITC. And I mentioned Gregory Weber synthesizing the Danzo proteins to attach the proteins. And I mentioned Shimomura who discovered green fluorescent proteins in the jellyfish. But I wanna say something else about Shimomura, which is interesting. As I mentioned, this is in the outer ring of the jellyfish. And he said in this paper when he was later describing the search for this, how to get this, he had to get to purify 70 milligrams. It took him 30,000 jellyfish, weighed one and a half tons. And I doubt if many of you would be using fluorescent proteins today if you had to purify it from one and a half tons of material. In fact, he said his hands got so tired cutting the rings out and he developed this, this ring cutting machine he describes where he would flatten the jellyfish and cut the ring. So boy, this guy deserved the Nobel Prize for this work. Now, let's switch to some other techniques, polarization, which as I mentioned is very important in fluorescence. And probably the first use of polarizers, although they didn't call them that, of course, were the Vikings. They had this sunstone, which now we think was probably Iceland spar or calcite, which are naturally polarizing. They would look at the sky in these overcast days, which are always overcast, let's face it, up in, in the winter up where the Vikings were at, and they would rotate it. And because scattered light was strongly polarized, they could see the direction of the sun and navigate, which was important as they went around the pillage and destroy villages around the world. So polarizers helped them in this job. But the first one to use the term was 1808 was Etienne Louis Melu in Paris, he observed sunlight reflecting from the windows of the Luxembourg Palace in Paris using this calcite crystal he rotated. And he saw that the intensity of the light varied as he rotated the crystal. And he coined the term polarized, to describe this property of light. And he published this in a paper in 1809. And it's interesting because he even came up with this rule, he would cross two polarizers that the intensity of the light passing through two of them 
he parted on the he panted on the cosine squared of the angle. So I think it's interesting that he recognized that already in 1809. But we owe a debt to David Brewster because he was studying uh, refractive index and and the angle of incidence on polarization, and that was in this paper on the law of partial polarization of light by reflection. And he discovered that at about 56 degree, you get total reflection in Brewster's angle, which you've heard about in the course. But he used that to construct a pile of plates polarized. You take a series of glass plates and you arrange them. And the, the second arrangement on the bottom is nice because if you arrange them that way in alternate orientations, you can keep the light in the same plane as it goes through. And these were used for people for, for many, many years. In fact, if you look at the original thesis of Gregorio Weber, in his thesis, where he's doing a lot of polarization, he describes this pile of plate polarizer that he had. And both Enrico and I in Gregorio Weber's lab, he would show us his pile of plates polarizer. And I'm, it's tragic that we, we no longer know what happens to it. It was a great, uh, a great device that he used in his day. And William Nicol, however, discovered that when you join two crystals of ice and spar at, at this angle of 62 degrees, um, you could pass polarized, you could get polarized light to come out of them. And this made the famous crystal polarizers. And nowadays there's many calcite polarizers used. I showed one when I gave my first talk. We have Glenn Foucault, Glenn Thompson, Glenn Taylor, Wallace Don, but lots of crystal polarizers. However, the Henry Ford of polarizers, meaning the guy that made it available to everybody, polarizers, was probably Edwin Land of the Land Camera fame. I mean, he started that Kodak company. But in 1929, he, as an undergraduate at Harvard, he dropped out the patent, the sheet polarizer, the J sheet, where he learned by embedding um, iodoquinine sulfate and nitrocellulose film, film and stretching them, you could generate a film that would work as a polarizer. And there he is holding up some of his original thing. And this made it much, much cheaper for everybody to play with. Now, I just wanna mention a very, very important paper on polarization energy transfer by Gaviola, the famous guy who did the lifetime, we'll talk about him again, in 1924. And he showed that when you have a very, very concentrated solution of sodium fluorescein uranin, and you look at the polarization in glycerol, you get zero polarization at first. And it's because it's so concentrated, so close, you can energy transfer between the fluorescein molecules, which depolarizes the emission. But he didn't know what was going on then. But then as you diluted and diluted and diluted to something like one over 20,000, you climb up to 0.45, the limiting polarization. It was this work, as we'll see, that helped inspire many people, including Francis Perrin, to investigate this phenomena, which he realized had to do to energy transfer. This was very important, the field of energy transfer. So let's talk about Francis Perrin, who was the son of the famous physicist Jean Perrin. And you learned a lot about translational diffusion, certainly from Enrico's original lecture in the course. But his son Francis Perrin was famous for rotational diffusion. And it's funny, it must have been when Francis Perrin was growing up, he said, Well, dad did translation, what's left for me? Well, I'll do rotation. So that's what he did. There's a good discussion of his life in an article by Mario Berberon Santos. But in 25 to 26, as I mentioned, he published important papers giving a quantitative theory of fluorescence polarization, including the classic paper. And here's Here's his original Perrin equation that I, I simplified for you before. And as I said, this was largely in the, in the province of physicists for two decades until Gregorio Weber did his thesis work. But first, before we go to Weber's work, let's first talk the time resolve. And I showed this picture before, and I said how R.W. Wood made the first attempt to measure the lifetime, as you see from this article, and he did a method which I thought was so clever, it's just amazing. Unfortunately, it didn't work, but you have to give him credit for the method. And he worked with this guy, University of Wisconsin, Professor Mendenhall, and they got a high pressure pump to shoot out a jet 
a fluorescent dye. They use different dyes, but let's look at anthracene was one of them. And they would get it going out at 230 meters a second through a tiny nozzle. And they scraped uh, the black material off the nozzle so they could shine light right through it. And then the idea was, well, by looking at the length of the fluorescence in this flow, they'll get the fluorescence lifetime, which was great when you think about it. Wow. Unfortunately, it didn't work. They said we could measure durations less than one over 2,300,000 per second, which is less than 435 nanoseconds, but they didn't see it. Well, that's because it was a shorter lifetime, but thanks to the work of wood, it put an order of magnitude on fluorescence lifetimes. It was less than this. And actually, more recently, 2013 and even today, I like this paper by these guys who made a flow chamber where they're flowing dyes of, uh, of terbium and europium, which gives long-lived fluorescence on the order of micro to milliseconds. And they can actually observe in the image what, what uh, Wood was trying to see and get the lifetime basically by plotting the image versus distance or time in here. So people went back to this idea. But it was the famous physicist Enrique Gaviola who first made the fluorometer. I told you that's why it's lifetime instruments are called fluorometers, spectrum are called fluorimeters. And he used, he built this already in Berlin where he was working in 27. And he was one of the most outstanding scientists produced in Argentina in all of its history. And we won't go into the details, but when you look at the professors he had, Frank, Hilbert, Perot, Born, Planck, you know, Stein, Einstein, Nernst, I mean, boy, that was a tough professors and a tough thesis committee. So, and he did a lot of famous work and he was the first one to measure phase lifetimes, okay? And I won't go into the details of the instrument, but for sodium fluorescent, he got 4.5 which is pretty good for rhodamine. He got two nanoseconds, which is right on what we measured today. So he did the first accurate measurements. Now, what about lifetime uh, micro microscopes? Well, it's not a recent invention. Already in 1955, 59, Benetta in this paper described an instrument where he says in the paper how he got all these parts from TV sets and whatnot. And he was able to, Get a lifetime, he looked at, uh, at lifetime of proflavin, I think, in the nuclei of tumor cells and some autofluorescence. He couldn't, he wasn't doing imaging, but just of the whole cell, but he was able to do some measurements. And uh, so he first was doing this work. Now this sentence appears in the 2006 books that 50 years ago, Worcester found two fluor fluorochromophores in close proximity changed their properties. That's not true. I mean, Forster did a lot of great work, but he didn't discover, discover it. Ario and Frank first discovered you could excite a mixture of mercury and thallium atomic vapors at 254 and see the emission at 535 from the thallium, although you excited mercury, meaning there's some transfer of energy. And uh, wow, oh, once again, you see, darn it, I clicked on the, uh, I, I clicked on the wrong place. Gaviola and Pringsheim did that polarization thing I told you. Per, Jean Perrin first proposed a mechanism of resonance energy transfer, and then Kalman in London did a quantum theory work on this, and Francis Perrin published a quantum mechanical theory, and he did everything except the effect of the overlap integral. And Tay Forster came and wrote the first complete theory. So yes, Forster did extremely important work, but he was standing too on the shoulders of other people in the area. And Forster is recognized for his important work. And I think it's interesting. There was the first uh, uh, International Tay Forrester, Theodore Forrester lecture series um, that came out. And the first lecture was Enrico Graton at that in 2007. It looks, however, like he's talking about particle tracking at the Forster thing, but I'm sure he worked energy transfer in there somewhere. I don't know. We'll have to ask him. But the origins of the first commercial instruments, which really led to a boon of the use of fluorescence in the field, 
came because of the anti-malarial research in the 40s. During World War II, the government issued a call to scientists to develop better treatments for malaria due to a shortage in quinine. Again, quinine, you see how important it was. And researchers at the NIH were trying to develop fluorescence assays, but they didn't have good instruments. And then finally, Richard Robert Bowman, in the Laboratory of Technical Development at the NIH, developed the first flexible instrument. And that led to the first commercial spectrofluorimeters with monochromators for excitation and emission produced with the American Instrument Company, which was located close to the NIH, Aminko, Aminko, and so it was marketed as the Aminko Bowman. And many of us old timers have actually seen these early instruments, which really helped to popularize and made it available to so many people. Well, because in 1956 this came out, and this is the original brochure, the cost was $8,000. You'd say, well, I can buy that from my allowance. But back in 1956, that's about $100,000 in 2017 dollars. So let's go forward a bit. Fluorescence in the 20th century. As I said, most of the basic principles were developed. Gaviola did the lifetime. Bevelov, the quantum yield polarization. Weigert observed it and Perrin quantified it. Energy transfer, Jean and Francis Perrin, Kay Forrester. But until the second half, fluorescence in biology and biochemistry was descriptive in nature, used usually as a role in isolation, purification, quantification, such as using compounds like riboflavin and porphyrins. And true quantitative work relied on Gregoria Weber. So let's talk now about the seminal contributions of Gregoria Weber, because a few of us were lucky enough to have known him and worked with him, and many of you did not. But during the last few decades, it became very important. And, and uh, certainly one individual, Weber, is singled out for his outstanding contributions. So let's have a bibliographic sketch. Well, he was born in 1916 in Buenos Aires, Argentina, on July 4th. And even today in the United States, we celebrate his birthday with fireworks. But that's another story. And there's a picture of him. And one year old, courtesy of Francisco Barantes, how he got a hold of this, Lord only knows. But, and Weber did an MD degree in uh, University of Buenos Aires. And I asked him why he did an MD. And he said, well, he loves science. And he asked his, he told his high school science teacher he wanted to be a scientist. And this high school teacher in Argentina advised him, that's good, but it's not always easy to make a living as a scientist in Argentina. And you should become an MD because then if it doesn't work out as a scientist, you have your medical career to fall back on. Fortunately for all of us, it worked out for him. But it's important to know he was an assistant with Bernardo Jose, who was awarded the 40, 1947 Nobel Prize, the first Argentine and Latin American to get a Nobel Prize. And in fact, he recommended that Weber apply for a British Council Fellowship, which were very difficult to get back down. Only a couple of the world were given out. And Weber got it to go to Cambridge to work with Malcolm Dixon, and we'll see that in a moment. And he got a thesis there, and he continued to work in, in Cambridge until 1952. Then he went to Sheffield in 53, and in 62, went to the University of Illinois, where he stayed the rest of his life. So as I said, Bernardo Jose encouraged Weber, and there he is back then in 43, to go to England. And Weber told me that that was during the war, and they had to go in a convoy. It took 44 days in a convoy to go to England. And I heard the story of that convoy many times, and each time he told me the story, I swear there were more and more U-boat attacks on the convoy. And here we see I'm going and there are U-boats occasionally. Oh, there, you see? Okay, I think you saw one there. But he survived and he got to England and then he started to work with Malcolm Dixon. Now, the old timers were, remember Malcolm Dixon was the world's preeminent physical biochemist at the time and the leading authority in enzymes. In fact, he recorded the first absorption spectrum of cytochrome C. You can see the influence on Weber being interested in spectroscopy. And he suggested that Weber consider applying fluorescence techniques to study naturally fluorescent flavin and flavor protein systems. 
Well, as Weber said, he knew little about it at the time. He knew there were some low molecular weight compounds, riboflavin, FAD, that had fluorescence of different intensities, but only a few flavor proteins were purified. So he was given the task of sorting out this area. He thought it would take a couple of years, and of course, he worked the rest of his life. Now here's his thesis, front page, uh, fluorescence of riboflavin diaphorase, which is uh, flavin binding proteins related enzymes. And here he is getting his PhD, uh, graduating in St. John's College in Cambridge in 47. And I wanna mention something, the final chapter of his thesis, because this has come up in the course. It's devoted to application of polarization measurements, determined viscosity of gels. And he actually wrote this in the final paragraph. So both the, he talked about the micro and the macro viscosity are of importance. And he realized the difference. And he told me personally, he realized that when he had gelatin and he put fluorescein in and you could bounce the gelatin in your hand, but the polarization was near zero, like in water. That's because fluorescein was in water pockets between the gel fibers. But rhodamine would bind to the gel fibers and you would measure a very high polarization. That gave him this idea and he talked about doing this in, in cells and the cytoplasm and whatnot. And that observation anticipated the work he published 24 years later when he first delineated the application of probes to study physical states of lipids. And I told you about that work he did with Perlin on, and Mayer Shinsky and all of that stuff. But that anticipated too the very important work done today, which this has expanded a lot. I think I got this slide years ago from Louise Bagatoli. So thanks again, Louise, with Lordan. And of course, now you've seen how important uh, these type of studies are. But before designing probes though, he carried out independent investigations. Um, I'm saying in terms of this theme designing probes, but he wanted to study methods to allow him to study proteins that did not contain intrinsic fluorophore because intrinsic fluorescence of proteins had not yet been discovered, which he will do of course. So he put a lot of time and effort, he said two years to come up with a probe danzo chloride, which is still used today, that he could use with the instrumentation available then and attached to proteins. And so with this, he began to look at several protein systems and he had two famous papers, a lot of citations on theory and then observation. It's interesting, the theory paper has an acknowledgement for Francis Perrin for his suggestions. I wish I had thought to ask him when I had a chance, what were the suggestions Perrin gave you? And he extended Perrin's theory to the case of ellipsoidal molecules carrying randomly oriented oscillators. Now, I want to show you some pages from that theory paper because I think some people think, well, big deal. He, so he had the Perrin equation, fine. It was a really difficult uh, paper at that time. And I'm just going to click through six pages, just glance at them as I go through it. This may inspire some of the mathematically oriented among you to look at these papers. So this was his first paper on polarization. As you can see, this is not a trivial work. In subsequent years, he continued to advance the theory of polarization. And this was done already in 73. But then later on in uh, the second paper, I'm sorry, yeah, in the second paper, it's a re-examination of several treatments. In fact, I think that paper was a little later than that, where it's the final, everybody agrees on the final papers, what everybody did for uh, anisotropy decay time resolved polarization. So this was the final one. And in, now to go back to his early career in 53, he was recruited by Hans Krebs to go to Sheffield, the biochemistry department at Sheffield. And as you know, Krebs is the guy at the Nobel Prize for the tricarboxylic acid cycle. And while during his years at Sheffield, he continued to lay the foundations of modern fluorescence. And here's a picture of the Nobel Prize celebration dinner when Krebs got the Nobel Prize. And there's Gregorio Weber and there's Krebs at the dinner. So that's interesting to see that. And one of his pioneering contributions was his report with David Lawrence on, on the fluorescence properties of xanthylone sulfonate. 
where he pointed out that in water is very weakly fluorescent, but in the presence of a protein or a nonpolar solvent, the fluorescence greatly increases. And after this, Leonel will do a demonstration to show you. It's a beautiful demonstration, easily done for all of your students. And it's still used today, ANS. Now, I've added to this lecture something I didn't have in my previous history lectures because I thought, what an idiot I am. So much talk in our lectures during this course on NADH, NADH, NADH. Well, who do you think first described the fluorescence of NADH? Of course, it was Gregorio Weber. And already in 1957, he described energy, intramolecular energy transfer in the ring system of NADH. But what I want to bring your attention to, this is 57, long before he had the capability to measure a lifetime. So then he talks about dihydro diphosphopyridine nucleotide. That's what they call NADH for a long time. And here he talks about calculating the lifetime from the polarization. And he comes up with 0.5 nanoseconds. All right, so remember that. His next paper on this topic was 1958, which was a very complete cop paper. Many, pa as you see, it's uh, eight pages long on all the fluorescence properties. And this was published, it's all written in French. I told you he could speak French. In the, in the French journal, Journal Chimique, Chimica Physique. And uh, again, NADH. And in here, you get to the end, it's interesting because he uses the equation, as he says here, the Forster equations that calculate the life of NADH from the basic absorption and in properties of it. Now, this was done, Forster's equation was 1951. It's interesting because in 1960, after this paper, Strickler and Berg came out with a, with a more complete and more accurate formula. But already during this, so he's calculating the lifetime in this paper, and he comes out with 0.34 nanoseconds. So I thought it was very interesting to look at his average lifetimes, 50, 1957, 1958, without measuring any lifetime, it's there. He comes out with 0.42. And I would say that was pretty darn accurate according to the phaser plots we've seen during this course. So they knew what they were doing back then. But very, very importantly then too, with his postdoc John Thiel, he did the first studies in the aromatic amino acids of protein. So they published a series of papers where they did the first description of the excitation and fluorescence spectrum of the aromatic amino acids. And they had this famous paper and figure seven from this paper has been reproduced many times in many reviews. And that's figure seven in the lower right down here. And in that paper, he did very careful excitation emission. It was very difficult back in those days to do these measurements. They were done in 56, but at any rate, that plot in the bottom right has been used many times. And I'm particularly proud of more recent use of it. Namely, I've been involved for a few years with NASA on our Europa project, where they plan to send a probe to Europa to land on the moon of, of one of the moons of Jupiter Europa and look for uh, different things such as biomolecules. And I, I insisted, well, they want it like to, to tryptophan, I said. And I said, well, you have to use this, this uh, figure from Gregorio Weber, and they did in their official uh, description. So there, Gregorio Weber was very proud to see a description of his work involved with the modern Europa project. And there it is. So I'm very pleased with that. Well, he continued to define, design probes all of his life. And he made this ANS, which is a dimer of ANS, which turns out to bind strongly in nucleotide binding proteins. He designed AIDAS, which is the very first self hydroreactive probe, so you can react with cysteine. He designs pyrobutyric acid, the first long lifetime probes to attach to proteins, but would have a long lifetime. And of course, you've heard many times here the famous series of probes, Loridan, Prodan, and DACA, and he studied each of them. And here's the, this is, I use this picture on the cover of my book, Introduction to Fluorescence, taking Loridan at minus 80 in glycerol and Loridan at room temperature. And you see the beautiful 
change in the color due to the relaxation of glycerodipose around it. And as has been mentioned before, it was Faye Ferris's technician that made this with them. But this is the actual lab they made it in. And this lab would put the fear of God in the, 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 the health and safety people nowadays. And those of us working in Weber's lab, we were fearful to even go into this lab. It just looks so, from a, a health standard, you were a little leery of this. But that's where all these problems came from. That lab, that's where Lordan started. So phase fluorometry, we're already in the 50s, he started to think about constructing a, a lifetime machine. And of course, he said he was influenced by the work of a fellow Argentinian, Gaviola. So he wanted to work on a phase fluorometer. And at that time, Burks and others had built some phase fluorometry. But in Illinois, with a student, Richard Spencer, they constructed the first highly versatile phase and modulation fluorometers using the principle of cross correlation. I won't go into that, but this cross correlation approach is still used today. It's the key to modern phase fluorometry and is universally used. And here's a picture from back then, before my time there, Richard Spencer, who built that, and Gregoria Weber. And uh, if Suzanne is there, she might recognize, or know that's Anna Jonas, who became well known in lipoproteins later. But again, we said that he had this machine, and of course he measured NADH with this, and he got 0.38 nanoseconds. So again, all these measurements were done, you know, five decades before the rest of us, okay? So it really was something. So modern phase and modulation fluorometry began when Enrico Gratton joined Weber's laboratory as a postdoc in 75, 76. And this is the famous picture of Enrico talking to Gregoria Weber as they walk across uh, the quad, the mall in the University of Illinois campus. And as he said, at the suggestion of Weber, he worked on developing a phase and modulation fluorometer or continuously variable frequency instrument. And he returned in 78 as assistant professor, Rico did, but by then he finished the first true multi-frequency phase and modulation fluorometer using the Paco cell, completing Weber's vision. And this shows the original instrument layout of Gaviola. This was Weber's thing where they used this famous Debye Sears tank uh, to modulate the light. And Rico's first Aquacell machine in 1983, and now many, many different types of flim microscopes are available. And Weber's work on phase of modulation fluorometry also, as I mentioned before, indirectly led to development of the phaser approach by Enrico. Awards. Well, Weber got a lot of awards in his life. Academy, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. I'm going to talk about some of these in more, de well, the, in more detail. The first national lecture. Many of you go to biophysics, I think, or know about it. And every year since 1969, they have a national lecture, a big shot in the field of biophysics. Well, the very first one was Gregorio Weber. In Guggenheim, National Academy of Argentina, National Academy of the United States, the Rumford Premium, I'll come back to in a moment, Disco Award, Replicant Award, I'm going to come back to in a moment and the Leblonsky Award. Now, Weber told me his favorite award he got was the Rumford Premium. And this is because it's the oldest prize in the US, given out every few years since 1839, set up by an account for Beckwist from Count Rumford. And Weber got it this year for his work on fluorescence. Uh, it's for in fields of light and heat. And these guys sharing it with them are Mills and Yang, and uh, Yang got the Nobel Prize for work on, on uh, gravitational theory. I'm not sure where that fit in, but Weber sharing the prize with these guys. And he said it was really nice to be on the list of other people who got it, like Jay Willard Gibbs, Edison, Wood, Michelson, Bridgman, Lant, Fermi, Onsinger, Town. So Weber said that's not a bad group to be included in. I guess not. And also the replicant. Well, in eight, 1985, the American Chemical Society started their Replicant Award for Chemistry of Biological Processes. And they gave it out to Weber was the first one to get it for his work on proteins. Again, I could give an entire lecture about Gregory Weber's contributions to proteins, but I'm focusing on the dynamics. But he did the, the 
fluorescence to study proteins, and that's another story. And we've had a lot of international symposia honoring Gregorio Weber. The first one we had, which Enrico and I organized, was in uh, Boca de Magra, Italy. And here we see Gregorio Weber. Here's Enrico. Here's me. And there's Ulysses Acuna. I told you I had a picture of him, the lignum lephriticum guy. And I only noticed recently, there's this guy at the corner. That's Jim Longworth. That was Gregorio Weber's first PhD student, believe it or not. So it's kind of nice to see, and a lot of other fluorescence people in the field, I won't name them all. And we've had a series of these Weber symposia, 10 of them in fact. We had them in Italy, then we switched to Hawaii, Maui, and then to Kauai, and then we switched to Brazil, Buzios. When we see the Kauai meeting, here's, a, a, here's some of the speakers there, a typical uh, day at the Kauai Weber meeting, Buzios is another great place to have a meeting. But I wanted to emphasize these meetings really are known for their total focus on the rigorous science. I don't want you to get the wrong idea looking at those locations, okay? And here we see Enrico demonstrating fluctuations in person at, the, at, the, uh, at one of the Weber meetings. And also Enrico gave a hands-on course on diffusion and particle tracking, which many people participated in this hands-on course. But that's another story, okay. The 11th Weber Symposium, we weren't able to hold it due to the pandemic this year. And uh, we weren't gonna have it in Brazil, but that's out of the question. So we hope maybe we can have it in January, 2022, but we have not picked the location yet. Who knows, Uruguay may be in the running, but time will tell what happens there. Um, and there's, if you go to the LFD, there's web pages about Gregorio Weber. And there was this book I, I helped to edit with many people wrote chapters in 2016 about, which is the 100th anniversary of Gregorio Weber. And Pacho Barantes is a beautiful thing about Weber's roots in Argentina. Rico has a talk and lectures and other people talking about Weber. And I have on my website, uh, things about Gregorio Weber. I also, anyway, we won't go into, into that, but there was a nice tribute to Gregorio Weber website done by David Lloyd, who was an undergraduate with Gregorio Weber at uh, um, uh, Sheffield. And uh, he got a lot of the old timers to write little tidbits and there's a lot of them there and you can see just that website. And I wanted to just mention one by Fred Sanger. Many of you know Fred Sanger's won two Nobel Prizes in chemistry in 1958 for protein sequencing, 1980 for DNA sequencing. So he had quite a, um, a career. And he knew Weber because Weber was down the, hall, down the lab bench from him, as he would say. And he said, I don't feel able to comment on his scientific work, it was in a different field. But I believe his contributions to science was more than we see in print. And I like this. During the time we were both working in Cambridge Biochemical Laboratory, he would frequently come over to my bench to see what I was doing, discuss my work, um, and make useful suggestions. I found this stimulating and often helpful to my work, as Gregorio had a considerable wider knowledge of science than I did and was a wonderful person. And that's a pretty nice statement coming from Fred Sanger. And I end with this, some of you have seen this before, but for those of you who haven't, let me say, this is really an actual conversation that took place between me and Gregorio Weber when we were in Hawaii. And as you see, I, I've barely changed since those days. And uh, there we are with Weber. And Weber said to me, you know, David, when I was much younger, an older colleague said to me, Gregorio, when you pass the age of 60, you will begin to notice that your students have more ideas than you and better ideas than you. And I said, gee, really, Professor? And then he turned to me and he looked at me for what I can only say was an alarmingly long time before he said, I have not found this to be the case. So that was his statement. And But I've thought in recent years, now that both Enrico and I have reached this August age category, I wondered what would happen if he were to ask Enrico and I this question. So I imagine 
suppose he, Enrico had been there and he said, how about you, Enrico? And I imagine what Enrico would say, probably say in their dreams. And I imagine what I would say. Oh, huh? Okay, so that's it. I'm done and uh, that's my final slide, Leonel. The talk is over.